In this lecture, we would understand the various psychotherapies. Some of the therapies are based on self-understanding, others are based on action orientation. And in this lecture, we would understand four major types of psychotherapies, which mainly are the psychodynamic, the behavioral therapies, cognitive therapies, and the human existential therapies. To begin with understanding therapeutic approaches, we would be focusing on the characteristics, aims, ethics and factors involved in healing. But before that, let's understand why these therapeutic approaches are important. Let's say you are cutting with a knife and accidentally you hit your finger. What would happen? You would immediately require a bandage or some ointment to get it healed. But what if a similar uh, thing happens with your mental uh, faculties. You can understand this with a simple example that there could be a stressful, stressful situation that you have to deal with and what would be your response, your bodily response in that scenario. So when we focus on the mental health, we understand that these therapeutic approaches are used when a behavior gets consistent. If it happens once in a while, if there is a sudden shocking news, uh, probably in your near and dear family, then what would happen? There would be definitely a high stress that would be generated, but that is a one-off phenomena. But what if with every small things, you start to develop anxiety, you start to develop a stressful situation. In that scenario, if this behavior goes consistent, we need to understand that therapeutic approaches at some point of time would be required. So under therapeutic approaches or what we say psychotherapy, what is important? Under psychotherapy, it is simply a voluntary relationship between a client and a therapist. Now client is a person who is looking for the treatment. Therapist is a person who is providing the treatment. Now since it's a voluntary that means it's a willing relation between a client and a therapist it's important that cooperation from the side of client should be there. There are certain circumstances where client do not agree to go to a therapist for the treatment. After few visits, they become comfortable and then they are willing to go for further therapies. But there are also circumstances where certain maladaptive behavior needs to be rectified. For example, a person knows that he is smoking, but despite of that, he is not able to get rid of smoking. In that scenario, what is required is a therapeutic relationship between the client and the therapist, and this would help the subject or the client change his or her behavior. And therefore, this behavioral change that can be brought about is through the psychotherapies. Now, these psychotherapies have certain specific characteristics. First of all, not anyone can do psychotherapies. You have a person who must undergo a practical training under a expert supervision in order to provide psychotherapy. There are certain set of guidelines which are provided for providing any of the psychotherapy. So we have uh, various types of psychotherapy that we would understand in the next section. Also, as we said, understanding be between the client and the therapist should be very, very viable and Client should be ready to share the emotional problems with the therapist. Also, this positive relationship between a client and a therapist would help rectify the problem and bring in solutions at the earliest. Now, the idea why psychotherapeutic approaches are given is very, very simple. Definitely, there is a stressful situation for the person. The person wants to get rid of this stressful situation. The person or the client wants to lead, lead a betterment uh, in the lifestyle or sometimes they require modification of habit. As we gave the example of smoking, if 
a client is looking or has a strong will that i want to quit smoking in that case modification of the habit is required and the idea of psychotherapy is to help a person modify their habits also sometimes the thought patterns are problematic if there are negative thought patterns it could lead to a stressful situation a situation where a person can start crying can develop anxiety around themselves so changing the thought pattern is also very important we need to develop positive thought patterns and also decision making poor decision making is one of the classic characteristics where a person or the client is unable to be successful in the life so assisting the client to make successful decisions or to help them make decisions is important also getting aware of oneself one's responsibilities in life would make a person genuinely uh, work towards rectifying the issues so all of these are some of the major aims of the therapeutic approaches now whenever we talk about therapeutic uh, uh, approaches we hear a word therapeutic alliance a therapeutic relationship what does this mean this simply means as we mentioned a relation between a therapist and a client and this should be a positive relation now understand this carefully there is two there are two words sympathy and empathy both of them are very very different so don't get confused whenever we focus on psychology we focus on empathy when i say sympathy it's simply if you see a person living in a slum and you feel pity about it you want to help him in uh, help them in some way or the other and that is sympathy however empathy is a feeling a intellectual level of understanding where you try to keep yourself in that position and understand or feel how would the things be with you and that is being empathetic so as a therapist when you are providing therapies to a client it's very very important that you try to keep yourself in the position of the client and then bring forward the discussion and this would help you better understand what problems exactly the client is facing so developing empathy becomes very very important also there is a phrase which we commonly use which is unconditional positive regard unconditional positive regard means whatever the condition be we keep that aside we simply have a positive regard towards the ideas being provided by the client the problems that the client is ready to share and therefore unconditional positive regard is important and empathy definitely is part of it so empathy helps to provide a healing relationship more the healing relationship there is more probability that a therapist would be able to take the client into confidence and uh, work with the feelings the thoughts the emotions and help the client get out of the distress situation so developing empathetic attitude becomes important now whenever there is a client who is approaching a therapist there are set of rules or steps of rules first of all the first and the foremost thing is to identify the problem so as a therapist the person would try to understand talk to the client and understand what exactly the problem is why the client is experiencing anxiety stress distress what whatsoever the case may be the next is identify the areas for treatment so you have to identify what is the target therapy whether it is inability to let's say find a job inability uh, to do well in the examination or afraid of 
facing an examination or afraid of communicating with people so whatsoever the areas are needs to be identified so first we understand the problem with the client the next step that we take into account is we target we target what areas are the broad areas where client is actually uncomfortable and then based on the areas that are identified choice of treatment is devised now this choice of treatment depends on the kind of problem whether it is related to let's say loneliness aloofness then probably humanistic ex existential theories would work good if it is due to faulty learning we can say behavioral therapies work good so there are various ways under which we would understand right technique to be used for the purpose of treatment in the separate sections for each therapies as we move forward but overall as we understand the clinical formulations this is a constantly ongoing process so we require a good insight into the content and understanding of the perspective and the uh, the surroundings of the client to resolve the issue the next is whenever a mentally ill person comes in as a therapist what is your responsibility as a therapist your primary responsibility is to first of all reduce the symptoms now anxiety stress can lead to numerous symptoms some of those symptoms can be simply physiologic uh, simply psychological symptoms but in certain cases these two could convert to physiological symptoms as well so reducing those symptoms in the first round is the primary responsibility of the therapist the next is along with reducing the symptoms the idea should be improving the quality of life now how can the quality of life be improved let's say a person who has undergone severe uh, ect therapies or electroconvulsive therapies in that scenario the person might be highly distressed highly uh, lonely and then it would be difficult for the person to adjust back to normal life so to improve the quality of life we usually say three types of trainings are given first is the occupational training occupational training says that anything that could help you attain uh, a kind of work discipline this could be related to let's say uh, candle making or paper bag making and all those activity could actually help get person involved the next is social skill training social skill training and explains that aloofness or re uh, remaining away from society cutting yourself from society becomes a common characteristic so it is important that social skill trainings are imparted where person tries to interact with the near and dear ones with the society and understand and discuss the uh, things the last is vocational therapy now vocational training or vocational therapy we could say is provided to help person find a occupation so training them into particular skill set now these skill set could be let's say a skill set of plumbing a skill set of being uh, engin of engineering of carpentry or uh, of gardening any skill set that a person is interested Ident identifying that and providing training so that they can have their life and take their life easily later on so rehabilitation of mentally ill people becomes a important challenge and as we said two of the things which are done by the therapist one is to reduce the symptoms and the next is to improve the quality of life by providing various kinds of therapies or trainings now what are the factors which contribute to psychotherapy the factors that contribute to psychotherapy are simple 
first is we need to understand a technique which is adopted by the therapist so what technique the therapist adopts in order to resolve a issue or a problem is important and whether the client is happy with that technique or not sometimes relaxation therapies works well sometimes restructuring therapies work well so identifying the right technique the second factor which contributes to healing process in psychotherapy is a good therapeutic alliance as we already mentioned so with this therapeutic alliance what would happen there would be a good relationship between the client and the therapist and client would be ready to share the problem and as a result therapist would help client understand the issue and help them lead a better life the next is getting interviewed at regular interval so the sessions should not be just once in let's say 40 days or 80 days but should be a regular session regularly interval section sessions which say uh, which can be two sessions every week four sessions every week so interval is important constant support and constant help would help the person get away from the problem the last and the most important factor that contributes to healing in psychotherapy is understanding non as non specific factors there are certain non specific factor that trigger the problem let's say a person is anxious just because uh, exams are coming near but there could be non specific factors for example okay uh, might be some of my family members would be going out i would not have a good family support probably uh, one of our family members would be visiting our house and those are not specific factors that are contributing to the actual problem but still the client tries to create a new boundaries around themselves and these are the non specific factors which are associated with psychotherapies and which are really important to understand from the point of view of the therapist so we usually identify the variables as either the patient variable or the therapist variable patient variables are those variables that uh, explain the expectation of improvement by the treatment or the motivation that has come into the client for changing their behavior so that is a patient variable or the client variable we can say on the other hand therapist be, uh, variable says that the therapist should focus on a positive nature should not get into a distress situation is if the therapist is not able to help the client uh, rule out the problem progressively also there should be absence of any emotional conflict in the mind of therapist very very important to note so therapist should be free of any emotional conflict and good mental health of the therapist themselves is important so those are some of the contributing factors for quick healing when a psychotherapy is given also while performing psychotherapy some of the ethics need to be followed the first is there should be a informed consent which needs to be taken from the client the confidentiality of the client is very important that means client is ready to share the problems with the therapist but therapist should take this responsibility that this is between the client and the therapist and therapist does not go around and publicly speak about the problems of the client also respect for human rights and uh, bringing in a positive relationship between the client and the therapist is important moreover professional competence of therapist is essential a professionally competent psychotherapist can help solve the problems at the very root or at the very early stages so those are some of the major things that we need to understand about the therapeutic approaches 
the basic know-how and then we would focus on the types of therapies so under therapies we have broadly three important therapies that we would focus right now and those are psychodynamic therapies behavioral therapies and cognitive therapies we would understand the differences between these three therapies on six different bases so the first idea is what is the root cause of the problem under a psychodynamic therapy we believe that it is a internal conflict something that arises from within so let's say there is no one else telling you anything but you yourself think that someone person x y z is thinking so and so about me and this is a conflict within yourself a internal conflict that is that you have created within your psyche you do not know what that person thinks and rather that does not affect you but still you have created a conflicting situation and whenever you face the person xyz you would think that this person has a following mindset about me so that is the main root cause that is being identified by a psychodynamic therapy under behavioral therapy we say wrong learning and wrong behavior are the major problems so for example a child is afraid of dogs now this is a faulty learning from the birth or the very early stages of childhood development and this needs to be rectified so what kind of therapies would be involved here here we would be using behavioral therapy however existential therapy as we always say is used when there is a big question mark about why i am i why i am here what is what do i hold importance for in the life of myself as well as others so you or a person starts to question about one's existence considering there is no point of having this life or i am not useful those are the kind of common uh, things that come up or is the root cause of problem under existential uh, is the root cause of problem where existential therapies are given so under the first case the psychodynamic therapies when those are administered we understand that there are certain uh, desires of childhood that are not ful fulfilled and certain fears in the mind of an individuals which are not resolved at a very early stage and therefore this complicates later on as and when it complicates it creates a stressful situation and to get rid of it psychodynamic therapies are provided however the reason of the behavioral uh, problems which could be resolved through behavioral therapies is very very simple and that is mal adaptive behavior let's say there are 20 students in a classroom 19 of them follow the discipline however there is one student who is always standing on the table rather than sitting on the table or uh, standing on the chair rather than sitting on the chair and that is an example of maladaptive behavior so that kind of behavior needs to be fixed through the behavioral therapy so any behavior which is publicly not seen let's say you are walking on the road and there are uh, dogs moving sideways there would be 20 people who would be walking straight forwardly but there would be one person who would be running unnecessarily because of the fear of dog and therefore this becomes a maladaptive behavior so behavioral therapies are useful to remove those kind of faulty learning patterns faulty behavioral patterns and faulty cognition or understanding cognition means understanding so wherever there is faulty understanding if i am explaining this topic right away and some of the students understand this incorrectly for any reason x y z then this becomes a faulty learning now when there is a faulty learning this would imply in the behavior at some point of time and therefore faulty behavioral patterns are the cause where 
in those scenarios behavioral therapies are administered existential therapy as we said a person has a big question mark about their life why do they exist what's their importance and that usually comes when the person is aloof when the person feels lonely or does not think that they are important by any means so treatment in all the three cases are important now under a psychodynamic therapy we usually provide a free association or dream interpretation we would be coming on to treatments independently in each of these sections when we focus on these topics in detail just to have a quick idea free association is a person is asked to relax and when a person is fully relaxed the person or the client would start to speak and in that point of time willingly unwillingly consciously unconsciously the person would explain the real cause of problem and then when the person is asked to sit and uh, jot down what he has been dreaming about those dream interpretation can help us understand or provide a good treatment methodology behavioral patterns are usually resolved either through systematic desensitization positive reinforcement uh, aversive learning or uh, negative reinforcement are some of the common examples we would be talking about each of those in the separate sections existential therapies usually focus on positive talks so talking to a person positively without any judgment because the person the therapist would consider that the client is talking about the problems and since the client is talking about the problems the role of the therapist is to bring the solution for the problems the therapist should not have any judgmental views about the client let's say a person comes in with a problem that they have uh, anxiety when the exam is near now in this case a person as a therapist cannot judge that this person is not prepared for the examination so it is judgmental you have to keep your views open as the client approaches you and in that case non judgmental talks are important only a non judgmental talk can be accepting and healing for the client the next is what is the role of the therapist the role of the therapist in all the three cases is very important in a psychodynamic therapy the therapist helps to provide an emotional insight to evolve and to gain understanding about oneself under a behavioral therapy the therapist helps to have an adaptive behavior a behavior which is followed by masses and is not different from the masses existential uh, therapy the therapist would try to provide that you are important you have certain values which others do not have and these are essential for your personal growth so understand that the therapist is the same person in all the three cases it's just the same person providing the therapies but in each of these therapies the outcome that would be witnessed would be different and as we can see in some cases you are trying to provide self understanding about oneself a emotional insight in the other cases it is action oriented where adaptive behaviors are uh, created or a mal adaptive behavior is being rectified so role of therapist is essential and this definitely benefits the client in a psychodynamic therapeutic approach the client would have a ability to interpret themselves and the conflicts could be resolved by oneself under the behavioral therapy all the faulty behaviors would be known and the person would then try to fix or rectify those faulty behaviors and finally under a existential therapy the person uh, usually have a idea of developing empathetic relationship and with this empathetic relationship 
more motives aspirations or values could be brought into account now as far as treatment is concerned psychodynamic is the longest of all the three it goes up for years and years and in some cases with modern uh, methods psychodynamic could be shortened to 10 to 15 sessions every session we have uh, five sessions every week so that is considered as a one big uh, chunk so the whole psychodynamic therapy that runs for years and years could then be squeezed however behavioral and existential therapies are relatively short and completed in few months so those are some of the major ideas based on which we understand the differences between the three major therapeutic approaches we would be covering these one by one separately so the first one is psychodynamic therapy. Now psychodynamic therapy was initially laid down by Sigmund Freud. Later on, his successor Carl Jung also followed with the concept of psychodynamic therapy, but it was analytical psychodynamic therapies. However, the later followers of Sigmund Freud, who were known as New Freudians, also establish their own unique versions of this classical psychodynamic therapy. Now, this psychodynamic therapy involves understanding the internal conflict, the internal psyche of a person and resolve the issues that are internal to a person. So, this psychodynamic therapy works in three stages. In the first stage, the client becomes familiar with the routine process of the relation with the therapist, what are the things and tries to uh, recollect all the superficial material into the conscious state of mind that is into the unconscious state of the mind. So let's say a person could be unconsciously worried about something and the person is actually not aware why there is certain change in the behavior which is seen and that is the thing which is happening in the back of the mind, the unconscious mind. So under a psychodynamic approach, the first thing is to bring those unconscious things into the conscious mind so that the client knows what the problem is. The second stage is the actual modality of treatment where there is firstly the transference, then the phase of resistance and then a phase of interference. We would understand all these three in a while, so don't worry. Uh, so there is the second stage where do you have the modality of the treatment. And the last stage is where finally the issues are resolved and the relation between the client and the therapist is over and the client is now ready to leave the therapy happily, getting rid of all the problems. So those are the three stages under which a psychodynamic therapy works. So as we said, under this psychodynamic therapy, there are two important components. First is the free association and the second is dream interpretation. So free association and dream interpretation form the basis of psychotherapy. What are those? Free association is very, very simple. The person is asked to relax and when the person is asked to lay down and relax, the person starts to speak out whatever comes to the mind. So the person is given a peaceful healing atmosphere where they constantly try to get themselves relaxed and whatever comes to their mind is being, is being said. As a result, all those things that were unconsciously in the mind of the client are being revealed and these are being taken into account by whom definitely by the therapist so this is a meta, uh, this is a method of free association to summarize again under free association free flow of ideas desires any uh, thing that is running into the unconscious mind is allowed the person is into a very relaxed state and therefore therapist is able to comprehend what the actual problem is regarding once the therapist gains this information the therapy actually becomes easier not only this when the client is 
brought into consciousness the client is then asked to mark down whatever has come in the dreams this could be simply by drawing symbols symbols simply by drawing images or whatsoever they have seen or witnessed when they were lying down and this process is known as dream interpretation later on these symbols and these things are being analyzed by the therapist the therapist tries to understand why certain symbols certain images have been drawn by the client now this is a more practical way why sometimes it so happens consciously or unconsciously the client won't speak everything but when it comes to drawing or marking as symbols they would mark because there is no issue of ego there and as a result dream interpretation becomes better or more successful and therefore dream interpretation is more preferred so there are indicators which explain a unfulfilled desire for example let's say person wakes up and draws a car so probably when the therapist would talk more the therapist could understand that the person has a strong desire to probably buy a car but is unable to buy a car and therefore that was part of the dream so there is how those unfulfilled desires could be interpreted through the process of dream interpretation so two important methods under psychodynamic approach i repeat again first is free association where free flow of ideas desires whatever comes into unconscious mind is being brought the second is those are being drawn as symbols as diagrams and being interpreted by the therapist and this is dream interpretation so free association and dream interpretation two important elements now what is the process how it actually takes place what is the modality of treatment the first is transference transference is the process where the client starts to identify the therapist now this identify uh, identification or association could be of various ways it could be positive it could be negative we'll understand in a while how so let's say the person is lying down and having free association now since the therapist is non judgmental the person the client can actually develop a positive feeling a feeling of being very close to that to the therapist considering them as a parental figure it could be a motherly figure or fatherly figure and discussing the ideas very naturally there could be another scenario the another scenario could be this person is totally against me so there would be a huge resistance that would be created now this resistance as i said can come consciously where a person thinks no this person is definitely deliberately trying to do my harm so i'll hide something so this is conscious there could be unconscious phenomena where the person who is not having that push thought that i should hide but still is hiding so this resistance could be conscious or unconscious the transference could be a positive transference or a negative transference when the therapist becomes a substitute for the person in present let's say it could be mother it could be father it could be any a uh, person whom the client is very close to this process is known as transference neurosis so transference neurosis is a process where the uh, the therapist becomes a substitute for the person in the present and this is known as transference neurosis very very important to understand now once there is certain kind of arrangement that is done as i said it could be a positive arrangement where the person develops a very close attachment to the therapist and is ready to share the problems then it is totally fine still if there is a negative transference and a resistance the therapist would take in all efforts to interpret now 
what is the next stage definitely if the therapist is trying to interpret the next stage is interpretation now this interpretation would come with two things two things are confrontation and clarification confrontation basically occurs when therapist point of view to the client is not uh, actually accepted by the client so there is confrontation a simple confrontation between two siblings on a piece of chocolate probably you would eat or i would eat so that is a kind of simple confrontation so the therapist points out to the client the kind of psyche that must be faced by the client so sometimes the client would be ready to hear that sometimes the client would not be ready to hear that if it is a positive transference the client would be ready to hear that if it is a negative transference there would be resistance so confrontation is important to understand the next is clarification clarification is the stage where therapist actually brings in a clear picture of the confusing event so what is confusing for the client is actually not confusing for the therapist the therapist who is external to the happenings is able to externally view and analyze why the things are running like this and it appears like a movie so the therapist has a much clear picture about what would be the next stage but the person who is in dilemma who is in a state of stress anxiety would not be able to understand why this is happening in so and so fashion so this clarification is to be brought and this is being brought by the therapist once the clarification is brought there is repeated process of understanding the process of clarification confrontation clarification confrontation and this is what is known as walking through so the therapist would walk through with the client with a series of confrontation and clarification every few sessions the therapist would have to explain that this is a confusing event remove it this is a positive event incorporated and this would constantly go on so this is walking through once with the process of walking through is done insight is the outcome now understand that this insight is not all of the sudden it is not similar to the insight that we have learned in the section on learning there it was all of the sudden aha feeling so uh, let's say a monkey is able to get the bananas from the roof by joining the rods together and creating a longer rod through which the bananas could be captured and a feeling of joy it's not that insight here here the insight is slow and gradual the unconscious memories are repeatedly brought into the conscious mind of the person and these unconscious memories when they are repeatedly brought into the conscious mind of the person the emotional and the intellectual level of understanding is resolved so slowly the irrational behavior the irrational patterns are removed and there is a willingness to change a willingness to get emotionally stronger and create a emotional insight so the outcome of the psychotherapy is a emotional insight diving into oneself much more deeper and much more uh, clearer so that is how psychodynamic therapies work as we said two important components under psychodynamic therapy are free association and dream interpretation and then the modality of treatment is such that there is the transference followed by resistance interpretation walking through and finally a insight and that is a emotional insight it is a slow and gradual process of diving into the unconscious state of mind and getting or transferring those unconscious things into the conscious mind walking through the problems and developing a strong emotional insight
Behavioral therapies are targeted to rectifying the faulty learning pattern or the maladaptive behaviors. Now, there is not one unified method that fits all. There are various strategies which are adopted under behavioral therapy in order to rectify the faulty learning, the faulty behavior and the maladaptive behavior. Now, also important to note, these behavioral therapies work very differently. For a person who is anxious versus a person who is highly depressed, the kind of therapies and the process, the modality would vary. So, as mentioned, there is no one strategy that fits all. There is no one therapy that can be uniformly applied to all. And the therapies also vary based on the intensity of the mental disorder. So let's understand the behavioral therapy, the basis of it. Now, to start with, I have a very simple example of a person who is smoking. Now, the person who says that I am there to smoke says that I know this is a maladaptive behavior. 90% of the population around me does not smoke, but I do smoke. So, first thing that is identified is the maladaptive behavior. So, once the maladaptive behavior is identified, what is the next step? The next step is the factor. So, it could be an antecedent factor. Antecedent factors are the factors that precede the behavior. So when a person says that I'm smoking, what is the thing that precedes that behavior? Probably it could be stress. So here stress acts as an antecedent factor to smoking. So as a therapist, your role is to identify why the person is smoking. Now we identified that stress is the reason why the person is smoking. So, antecedent factor is a factor, I repeat, which predisposes a person to involve into a certain behavior. And the stress, whenever this person does not smoke regularly, but whenever the person is, is in stress, the person would start to smoke. So, this is an antecedent factor. The next is a maintaining factor. Maintaining factor is a factor that leads to persistence in the faulty behavior. So this behavior would linger on and on. So when I say this behavior lingers on and on or goes continuously, we call this as a maintaining factor. So by interviewing the person, interviewing the close family members of the person, we can do the annual examination of that client and understand when this person smokes, what are the factors that lead to smoking for that person? And finally, what are the feelings that that person gets involved with and that acts as a maintaining factor? So once the person is in stress, the person starts to smoke. And then after the person starts to smoke, what are the factors that continue to force him to smoke? So those are the maintaining factors which always reinforce uh, the person to get a relief from the anxiety which is caused. So there is understanding of the antecedent and the consequent operations. I have a very simple example. Let's say a person, a child is there. Now when the child is at the homework, the child says I am hungry. The child eats a lot of food. But what happens at a dinner time? At the dinner time, the child rejects, I don't want to eat anything. Now, as a mother, what you can do? There could be two ways to approach it. First is an antecedent operation. The next is a consequent operation. The antecedent operation is pretty simple. You cut down the amount of intake of the food at the time of tea. Probably the child would get hungry and consume more in the dinner. So this is an antecedent. This is something prior. So you reduce the food at the time of the tea and therefore the child would remain hungry and would consume more at the dinner time. This is an antecedent operation. What could be a consequent operation? Consequent is something that happens after. Let's say a child 
takes the diet normally during the dinner time rather than leaving it as such you simply praise the child and this is a consequent operation the child would be happy about it and when the child would be happy around it probably this would become a habit next time and this is what is a consequent operation clear so two operations that are very very important in behavioral therapy is the antecedent operation which is prior to the if the things that you manipulate prior to the consequence consequent operation is as a result of the consequence so once done you are trying to bring that into practice both of these methods be it the antecedent or the consequent would slowly remove the faulty behavior and create a more adaptive behavior now as i previously mentioned behavioral therapy is not just a one sock that fits all it is a series of techniques that can be involved and here is the list of these the most important ones that we focus are the negative reinforcement and the aversive conditioning two of these are very very important all of these techniques are directed to change the behavior of an individual to make a maladaptive behavior or to convert i can say a maladaptive behavior into a adaptive behavior this could be through reinforcement techniques this could be through operant conditioning methods as we have studied in learning so let's understand these techniques one by one the first technique is a technique of negative reinforcement negative reinforcement simply means you try to move away from a dangerous stimulus as simple as that and this is what is negative reinforcement simply meaning that if there is a extreme cold weather situation you simply try to keep yourself away from that situation so what you can do is you can buy a electric heater you can have a big jacket over you and that is how negative reinforcement works so negative reinforcement simply put helps you to move away from the dangerous stimuli and help in creating a behavioral modification and this is a negative reinforcement the next is aversive conditioning aversive conditioning is something you want to keep away from for example a person consumes alcohol so you want that this person should quit alcohol what you can do is give a person a mild shock and then ask him to smell the alcohol do it for 3 or 4 or 5 times the sixth time the person would say oh this is something which is not good the smell is obnoxious i should leave alcohol okay so this is a kind of aversive conditioning a repeated uh, association to a undesired uh, response and the undesired response in this case was a electric shock so you are repeatedly asking a person to smell the alcohol and give a shock smell the alcohol and give a shock that means it creates a undesired pairing and since this pairing is undesired there would be aversion the person would try to move away from the issue and this is one type of behavioral therapy the next type of behavioral therapy is very very simple which is positive re reinforcement child does a homework mother prepares something special in the dinner a very simple example of positive reinforcement also sometimes with the positive reinforcement we say token economy works token as a symbol of reward now this token could be anything this could be a simple uh, a simple rubber a simple pencil and this token actually motivates the child to complete the homework and this is what is known as token economy so either a positive reinforcement which could be a special food or the favorite food that the child likes to be prepared if the child completes the homework on time 
or just to give him a small token of reward that the child is fond of necessarily not the reward should be expensive or difficult to procure but a small token that could actually create a positive momentum and this is part of positive reinforcement so understand uh, we have understood how negative reinforcement works how positive reinforcement works how aversive conditioning works and token economy works the next is further interesting the next we say is differential reinforcement now what is differential reinforcement differential re reinforcement is understanding what things could be reinforced and what things the wanted behavior should be increased and the unwanted behavior should be reduced so a very simple example here again there is a small child who goes to a toy shop there the child wants to have certain toys now the child cries and cries and cries and asks the parents to get the toys the parent does not want to motiva motivate this kind of behavior so what they would do is they would not get the toy the next day what happens is the same child again with the parent goes to the toy shop rather than creating a big scene in the toy shop crying and crying aloud the child simply requests that i am liking this toy if possible can i get this toy the parents get very happy and get the toy for the child now this is a process of differential reinforcement where the child now understands that if i am crying that behavior is unwanted it should be reduced if i am requesting politely this behavior is good and it should be motivated so this is how differential reinforcement works and the behavior which is wanted is given a push however the unwanted behavior is given a, uh, a decline we could say so this is very very practical way of doing behavioral therapies the next important method is systematic desensitization now this method was brought by wolp wolp basically said that whenever there is a fear provoking situation a situation where the fear level increases in those scenarios systematic desensitization works well how we have a very simple example here the child here is afraid of dog and every time the child sees a dog the child either tries to run away fear or create a panic situation now how can a systematic desensitization work the very simple way here is let's see you are there as a therapist with a child so you can yourself go very close to the dog and explain that the, the dog did not did any harm to you the child would see you and probably try to imitate and slowly and gradually the fear which was there or the fear provoking instance would reduce so now this works by two ways one is the person or the therapist would try to do this as a role figure and that thing would be imitated by the client the second thing is the person the client would be slowly introduced to it rather than having a very wild scene where a dog is running behind the person like anything we could have a systematic desensitization where the person is slowly brought closer to the dog the distance is slowly reduced and this is the process of systematic desensitization there could be a scene where therapist could provide food to the dog and this would help the client also at least try if not provide food go closer to the dog and this is how systematic desensitization works so it is systematic as the name suggests and desensitization that means the issue with which you are sensitive slowly gets desensitized it's no more sensitive for you 
Also, this follows the principle of reciprocal inhibition. The reciprocal inhibition principle simply explains that there are two mutually opposing forces that are working on the same time. So, what you need to do is you need to inhibit the weaker force. And once this is done, the relaxation response automatically moves in. So, principle of reciprocal inhibition i repeat again reciprocal inhibition says that there are two mutually opposing forces which are working on the same time the weaker force needs to be inhibited and therefore the opposite force would already uh, would automatically gain momentum and there would be more relaxation that can be provided in a fear provoking instances which can in long run reduce the levels of anxiety the next is modeling modeling is a common way a person wants to become something like the role model. So let's say a child here wants to become like Abraham Lincoln. So the therapist who either themselves can act as a role model or can explain how their role model used to do. So those are the things through which learning can be strengthened and behavior, a maladaptive behavior can be rectified. So you can explain, okay, this is your role model and he does this, he or she does this. So you can also do the things in the following manner. The next important way is vicarious learning. Vicarious learning is nothing but simply learning by seeing others and that's how a child grows in a school. A child when on the first day is asked to climb up the slide and move down the slide, probably 5 of the 10 children may be afraid but the other 5 who move down the slide, the 5 children who are afraid would see them and try to take a step forward and enjoy the slide later. So that is what is vicarious learning. Vicarious learning is simply learning by observing others and in this process small changes are there or small rewards are there which change your behavior. So this is an excellent way of bringing in behavioral changes. So in this section, we have understood how various behavioral therapies work and the various examples which you can understand the therapies with. Cognitive therapies help understand the psychological cause behind a distress situation and the reason why irrational thoughts and beliefs are generated into mind. So under cognitive therapy, we would understand three basic therapies. The first is RET, which we call as the rational emotive therapy. The next is the BATS cognitive therapy and finally the CBT or the cognitive behavioral therapy. To begin with, the very first therapy which is the rational emotive therapy, this therapy believes in a simple ABC principle. What is this ABC principle? A means antecedent, B means belief and C means consequence. So antecedent is something that precedes the irrational behavior the belief we can say here is the irrational belief and the consequence is uh, something that is because of the irrational belief now usually when i say must when i say should these are some of the phrases that particularly uh, denote a kind of irrational belief in certain circumstances not always uh, let's say if I say you must attend the class regularly so that must is fine but let's keep it into a different form where I say uh, I should be praised in class every day now if I say I should be praised in class every day this makes it a irrational belief and this is an antecedent 
a antecedent that would trigger this irrational belief that i am something very special in the class and i should be praised in the class and finally the consequence is the requirement for a therapy and therefore we call it as the abc or the antecedent behavioral consequence analysis which is the rational emotive therapy so firstly there is a irrational belief a belief that i should be uh, praised by everyone i should be loved by everyone i should be respected by everyone i should be uh, made the most important person of so and so so this is where a irrational belief comes into play and usually most of the irrational beliefs are refuted by the therapist and they are through the process of non directive questions if the questions are directive then uh th that would probably lead to a feeling of inquiry among the mind of the clients and therefore the questions should be gentle the questions should be non directive in nature and moreover it should be a assumption about what the life should be what this problem should be if this comes to a therapist how the client would handle it and in this fashion the red therapy works and there is a reduction of psychological distress so the most important form here is the questions which are put by the therapist should be gentle should be non directive and directed to changing the philosophy of life for the client reducing the irrational beliefs and gradually increasing them into a rational logical viewpoint the next is back cognitive therapy back cognitive therapy experiences or explains that childhood at some point of time uh, experiences uh, the that a child has in the younger age group which is either developed by the family or developed by the society what we can say the core schema around the child create certain beliefs certain notions in their life now when these beliefs these notions are created this could be a reason for the requirement of cognitive therapy later for example if a child is neglected in the early stages by the parent this could be a reason where child in the later stage can think that i am not wanted if the child is not uh, decent looking the child can develop a feeling that i am ugly if a child does not perform good in one or two assignments a child could develop a feeling that i will never succeed now all these which i quoted that i am ugly uh, i'll never succeed i am not a wanted child in those cases there are a cognitive structure but this cognitive structure is not functional it's not exactly what it should have been and therefore we call these as dysfunctional cognitive structures so these are a thought structure definitely there is a thought that came into a mind but this thought is not a functional valid thought and therefore we call this as a dysfunctional cognitive structure so the back's cognitive therapy focuses on identifying such beliefs identifying such dysfunctional cognitive structures and creating an opposite viewpoint where the client automatically directs itself uh, herself or himself to a cause where these negative thoughts or the dysfunctional cognitive structure is slowly converted into a functional cognitive structure and the negative thoughts that are generated into the mental structure are gradually removed so that is where back cognitive therapy works now this therapy is a highly open and a practice therapy usually lasts very short uh, 10 to 20 sessions are considered fine for this therapy and 
even the therapist should be uh, uh, friendly enough because the client needs to share the viewpoints the next is the cognitive behavior therapy which we also call as the cbt now this is a unique therapy as the name suggests it connects the cognitive aspect and the behavioral aspect now the understanding and how a person should behave is brought together and therefore the environmental manipulations make the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy a unique therapy because of which it is also known as a biological psychological and a sociological approach so it involves your biological makeup it involves the process of conditioning it involves the psychological framework where the negative thoughts are to be translated into positive thoughts and the social surroundings the um, the uh, the social setup the family setup the peer group so all of those matter in a cognitive behavioral therapy it is considered very very effective specifically for diseases like anxiety depression panic attacks or in cases of borderline personality disorders so there is where we usually apply the cognitive behavior therapy so as we understood under the cognitive therapies we have three important therapies that we have discussed in this section humanistic existential therapy now this therapy as we understood in a humanistic model the idea is self actualization to develop oneself into a integrated personality now when i say integrated personality it means a personality which is much more balanced without being fragmented if there is a difficult situation the personality would not get into extreme stress and it would not be a scenario that the person is not able to handle it and therefore we say it is an integrated personality so it's a complex of uh, having a variety of characteristics into oneself to be a integrated self which can be much more balanced without being fragmented however if this self actualization drive is not achieved in that scenario humanistic existential therapies are provided so if the person tries to think that there is no personal growth i cannot grow further sometimes even the basic requirements are not met but if the basic requirements are met the self actualization is not met and in that case humanistic existential therapies are given the idea is to heal the person so the role of the therapist is merely a guide or a facilitator the therapist won't do anything the therapist would simply help the person realize and create a responsible scenario the person the client himself or herself would take the responsibility to move out of the problem situation and therefore healing process occurs and this is a process that is naturally happening by creating a integrated self so this humanistic existential therapies can be broadly defined into three types existential therapies client centered therapies and gestalt therapies to begin with the existential therapy which was given by victor frank this therapy focuses on a ancient term which was logotherapy logotherapy means meaning making uh making meaning of everything so that means if anything is brought to you you try to take that into a positive scenario and consider that this would change your life for betterment a very simple example to quote us let's say there is a life threatening event now once you are out of that life threatening event and you have incurred numerous mental physical psychological losses in that process once you are out of that threatening episode you still think that life is meaningful and you try to work for your existence find out a spiritual means to attain the existence and therefore making meaning is very very essential and this 
is where existential therapy works. The therapist tries to explain the client why we exist, why we are a unique person on this earth and why our contribution is so important. So this is how uh, existential therapy works. But on the other hand, if we look from the client's perspective, client sometimes might be highly depressed or into a very uh, challenging situation and therefore it is essential that therapist gives a good atmosphere maintains the values the feelings of the client and then uh, create a situation where client is uh, client tries to get themselves out of the problem situation the next is client-centered therapy this therapy was propounded first by Carl Rogers and this is totally based on the concept of empathy. Empathy, as we have understood before, is a very uh, basic construct where we focus on keeping oneself in others' position. It's not something similar to sympathy where we have pity on others, but we try to understand that what if we were in the same situation, what could have been done? And therefore, role of empathy is important. So client-centered therapy propounded by Carl Rogers focus on empathy and believes in an unconditional positive regard. Unconditional positive regard represents or explains that there is a positive warmth uh, or a positive feeling by the therapist. Therapist is not at all judgmental. Therapist is trying to understand and uh, create a friendly atmosphere, is highly cooperative and this would help the client to become a integrated personality as mentioned which is the basis for the humanistic existential therapies. This would also increase the level of adjustments for the client and therefore is a highly recommended method where client has freedom, has a, a close feeling of security and trust with the therapist. So this is what client-centered therapy focuses on. The last is the Gestalt theory. Gestalt theory was first propounded by Fritz Perls along with his wife Laura Perls. Both of them aim to increase the individual self-awareness. Now how was their idea to increase the self-awareness? The idea was to accept Accept it by yourself and then you would be able to resolve the problem. So any fantasies that come around the conflicts or the irrational thoughts should be accepted and no longer be considered as fantasies. Sometimes there are situations where students come up with a report card but still they have a dream oh this report card could be changed there could be new marks that could be allotted and i could get probably uh, this much i would pass in this paper so what happens is acceptance so acceptance is to be realized by the client fantasy and the world of fantasies has to be avoided this therapy, specifically the Gestalt therapy, is classically used with group settings. A person would try to accept the problems best when they are in a group setting, not as an individual setting. So Gestalt theory works best in group therapies. So group settings. So these are the three important forms of humanistic existential therapies for psychological therapeutic operations. Biomedical therapies are another form of therapies which are given to the client. But here, psychologists cannot move forward because what is required as medicines for treatment and since medicines for treatments are required who would be taking into role is the psychiatrist psychiatrist are medical professionals who can prescribe the medicine psychologists cannot prescribe the medicine so the things that cannot be resolved by psychologists are handed over to psychiatrist medical treatments drugs or ect is given for extreme cases. Now, 
certain medical uh, certain mental disorders if those are more severe for example post traumatic stress disorder there could be a trauma situation a sudden cyclone hit the region and as a result the house is lost everything is lost some near and dear ones are lost so it could be a post traumatic stress disorder similarly there could be uh, other uh, mental disorders schizophrenia could be one of those in those cases medicines are given now these medicines can vary the strength of these medicines can vary in normal conditions milder medicines are given if the conditions get extreme strong medicines are given and this should be given under strict medical supervision they do have lots of side effects uh, some of the common side effects are uh, lethargy dizziness higher amount of sleep levels uh, aiming to relax the person and therefore medical therapies are the part of the psychiatric treatment next to this is if the things cannot be still resolved by medicines electroconvulsive therapies which are known as ect are given and these electroconvulsive therapies are electric shocks given to a person now these electric shocks induce convulsions in the body and as a result there is changes and improvement in the behavior of an individual so ect or electroconvulsive therapies are the cases where medicines actually do not work and uh, these are administered when the drugs are not able to control the scenario alternative therapies are those therapies where we believe that the conventional treatment the drugs the psychotherapies are uh, not that useful or sometimes there could be other methods that could be sought so what kind of alternate therapies we uh, recommend so those are yoga we have meditation sometimes herbal remedies are explained and sometimes uh, methods like acupuncture acupressure uh, are explained now all these are what they are alternative therapies now under the alternative therapy we believe that psychological distress has been since long uh, a problem but over the last 20 to 25 years there have been lots of development in the field of yoga and meditation breathing practices pranayam uh, reciting or chanting of mantras so those are some of the ways through which attention gets focused and once the attention gets focused the irrational thoughts the irrational beliefs are slowly removed under the alternative therapies we would first talk about three important uh, systems the first is the vipassana meditation vipassana meditation is a mindful uh, mindfulness based meditation where there is no object in front of you the person simply sits and tries to concentrate on a abstract point closing the eyes and all the bodily sensations all his awareness would pass through that stage and that is the vipassana meditation the next is sudarshan kriya yoga Sudarshan Kriya Yoga is a set of breathing exercises. Now these are uh, highly recommended for disorders like anxiety, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, sometimes uh, stress which is because of medical illness. In all those cases, there has been Sudarshan Kriya Yoga which is practiced which is believed to be a good cure. Nimhans, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences have explained that Sudarshan Kriya Yoga has been highly effective in reducing the cases of uh, depression. Also, it has been quoted that alcoholic people who practice Sudarshan Kriya Yoga have significantly reduced levels of stress and depression. People who are not able to sleep, insomnia, a disorder as it is called as. So insomnia can be treated with yoga and Sudarshan Kriya Yoga as it improves the quality of sleep. The next is Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is a yoga method where breathing practices are 
along with chanting of mantras so both breathing activities along with chanting of mantra would be part of the kundalini yoga so kundalini yoga helps in giving emotional stimuli helps in developing better response and reducing the negative thoughts also we focus on progressive muscle relaxation technique now this is a state of relaxation in a progressive muscle relaxation the client is taught to contract certain group of muscles in order to make the client aware that the stress level has been induced then the client is asked to relax it slowly and this is a progressive muscle relaxation technique the idea is when you are contracting the tension gets confined and when you are relaxing it is slowly dissolving the client would try to practice this and relax the muscles whenever there is a stress situation a tension situation a anxiety situation that arises so this form of progressive muscle relaxation is also practiced and this is one of the best ways we could say where anxiety can be treated uh, usually people who are alcoholic who have uh, who are indulged in smoking have higher levels of stress at certain point and therefore they are inclined towards these activities and as the result of progressive muscle relaxation or sudarshan uh, kriya yoga these could be significantly reduced so those are some of the methods of alternative therapies which have been explained